I really didn't uh, think of becoming a religious until I went to high school. And it was this particular sister that I really admired and um, very inspiring of what she did, um, the way she did it and her commitment to her religious life kind of attracted me. And everything she did, you know, she gave her best and she gave her all. And um, at the time, I said to myself, if that sister could do it, I could do it too. In 1961, two sisters of Nazareth came to our front door. And by the time those two sisters of Nazareth had left, maybe an hour later, I just knew I was going to be a sister of Nazareth. When I look back, it's, um, it's all, you know, God's grace that given me to be able to do this. I'm celebrating my golden jubilee on the 24th of May, so that'll be very nice too. And we're booking the MCG. <laughs> I went to the Sisters of Nazareth, um, and uh, when the door was opened, it, was, it wasn't through the warmth of the building, but it was the atmosphere of warmth, and, and if you like, and that welcome. And I said, Lord, this seems to be where you want me to be. And so here I am, and so a lot of years have gone by, and I'm still there. What attracted me to the Sisters of Nazis was the children, because my mother had died very young, left us five little children. So when I was about 16, really, I thought, oh, you know, that would be nice work to give children a home. It's something that makes you happy and be at peace with yourself, you know, in the future. You've got to think of the long term and, and in the future. I mean, I've been asked, you know, why did you become a, a nun and not getting married, you know? Um, why did you give up all this and be like the way you are? And I just say, you know, maybe Mr. Wright didn't come along the scene, but Mr. Perfect came along and said, follow me, be my spouse. In actual fact, you know, you give up married life and you give up children, but it doesn't stop you from being a loving person. My family is very good, uh, devoted Catholic too. I grew up in, in that environment and that's how it all began. But I just knew from the minute they came in to the time they left, it's what I wanted to be. And I entered the following February and I was 18 years of age when I entered. Victoire Lamanière, Mother St. Basil, was born at Liffre, ile de Brittany, on July 21, 1827. In 1851, at 24 years of age, Victoire came to England, where at Hammersmith, London, she founded the congregation of the Sisters of Nazareth and was the first Superior General. The work that began under such humble circumstances thrived, and in 1864, the congregation was officially recognised by the Vatican. Ten years after Mother St. Basil's death in 1888, the first sisters came to Australia on the steamer SS Ormuz, a mail carrier, to make their first foundation in the goldfield city of Ballarat. The Ballarat Foundation was the beginning of a chain of Nazareth houses which were eventually established in Australia and New Zealand. The Sisters of Nazareth is a worldwide congregation of religious women. For us, what makes Mother St. Basil or Victoire Lamenia Different would be our core values. Compassion, justice, hospitality, respect and patience. These are values that Mother St Basil showed and held in high esteem and this sums up the Sisters of Nazareth. We do have our spiritual life, we have our religious life, we have our community life um, and we're all just individuals, you know, we're, we're just normal people, it's just that we've been called by God to live a special life. When you feel that you have a vocation, then you go and check it out, that's what. <laughs> Yes. Yes. And it will gradually unfold to you. It's, it's, really, it's, you know, it's so true that God writes with crooked lines. It's only when you actually look back on your life that you can actually see that he was there all the time. As I was sort of growing up too, I always sort of went to Mass on Sundays yes. because I always felt that God had given me so much that I needed to keep that going. So God was always there. 
and this call just it just became stronger and stronger and I knew really in the end that if I didn't answer the call or do something about it I really wouldn't have any peace. You know I didn't know any nuns when I was young like no contact whatsoever with any religious you know only when I was in my 20s that um, in my faith developed from there then. Uh, but when I got to New Zealand, I found the Sisters of Nazareth there. So I went in and worked with them and, um, for two years, and it was an orphanage home. I wanted to get married and have children because I love children. Um, but when I got to New Zealand and actually being with the sisters and the work that they did with the children, um, that really kind of reinforced me of the calling that I received. It has always been the culture of the Sisters of Nazareth to welcome and nurture all in their care. At Nazareth House, the residents enjoy many varied activities. Trips and outings are popular and are a regular way of life. This is a community where everyone is made to feel valued, respected and loved. Hospitality is one of their wonderful charisms and uh, they certainly show that to whoever comes to their front door, so that, that's, uh, that's wonderful. and. Uh, Great love and compassion for everybody, especially the aged. The only one that's ready is Milton. Oh, we see. I'm going to go <laughs> the first cab off the ramp, aren't yeah. you? They fly so high, nearly reach the sky. Our ministry today is diverse. In Australia, we have sisters who do administration duties, nursing, teaching, childcare, catering, secretarial duties, pastoral care, therapy assistance, diversional therapy and vocation ministry. With the Sisters of Nazareth, I chose because of the spirit and the charism of the congregation and also the commitment in the work that they do. But I suppose the main thing that really kind of attracted me about the Sisters of Nazareth is their dedication and self-sacrificing. But the spirituality of the Sisters, the prayer life too, that if the prayer life is there, and then you go out into your work, it kind of, it helps you along and it, and it gives you that energy to keep going. And we also play at the same time. You will have time for that. So it's not, not all pray, pray, pray. It's not all work, but we also give in the time to, to recreate with one another. And the support too in community life is very, very important in a religious. Each of our homes is called Nazareth House owned and operated by the Sisters of Nazareth. The congregation has provided care for the aged and children for over 150 years. Nazareth House is very much driven by the Sisters' mission. It's a fairly simple mission, just caring for others to the best of our ability, basically, and it doesn't matter who they are, we care for them. Everything is done for you. Everything, your beds made, your meals cooked, everything like that. Oh, they're wonderful. Even the carers, they're born, you know, you'd have to be born to put some of those old things. Happy birthday to you. I thought I'd miss my outside friends so much because they're old and can't drive. I've made lovely friends here and it's lovely. How many eggs in your big cake? Oh, I didn't ask them. <laughs> <laughs> it must be for you. <laughs> How are you feeling today, Dorothy? The Sisters of Nazareth are dedicated to enriching the lives of the residents by providing a home-like environment and striving to give quality, holistic care. And it's not always just the age to benefit. Uh, I came in here last year because my mother's health broke down and uh, Mum's downstairs and I'll be upstairs because that was the best solution for both of us. So I met my physical needs and my spiritual needs and emotional needs. My bones break easy, so... I was born like this, so I think it helps you. What's helped me have been born with disability, because you require a temperament to, to cope, and yeah, you have a good days and bad days, but not too many bad days. <laughs> Several of the residents who are unable to go to Mass due to illness um, receive communion from both our pastoral care team, which includes some of the sisters as well, and at times some of the priests take them communion outside of Mass. The body of Christ.
When they come to Nazareth House, they come to live, not to die, and they're not dead until they've taken that last breath. But I think being able to help them, like, you know, like through that door and, and through death is really, is really what it's all about. It's actually, it's a privilege to be able to do that. It's actually, if you like, it's the ultimate of what we're here for, to actually see them through this life into the next life. And again, it's always a bit difficult to explain, but it is a wonderful privilege. Um, I think really to know that you're with someone and one minute they're actually in this world and the next minute their body's there, but that spirit, that soul is actually not. And it's, it is a wonderful feeling to know that God has come into that room, if you like, and has taken that soul to heaven. And, and you do see some extraordinary things, you know, it's, and they're not always the same, um, but I have seen some extraordinary deaths and, and people who have definitely seen something that did not belong to this world and people who can actually sit up and put their arms out and, and smile. And so, you know, there, it shows that we're not just a physical body. There, there's a lot more to us than that. It's a moment of grace um, because seeing somebody there dying, it's like um, you, you, somehow or other you get a special grace to being able to, to, to be with somebody who is ready to go to God. Uh, and to prepare the soul um, uh, for that journey. Yes, I think it was the daughter, and she was actually quite afraid of death and, and actually expressed the fact she didn't really know what to do. And so it was just that it was obvious that he was dying, he would die very soon. So it was a matter of really just talking her through it and talking to the father at the same time. So she was actually involved in the conversation. And it was really lovely because he was dying. She was talking to him about old times and I was just talking to her and we were reminiscing and then was able to say to her, your father is shortly going to go to heaven. And within a couple of minutes he actually went. So. What happened was there was no fear then in her and she just thought this was just this wonderful experience because the fear was taken away and it became such a personal experience between her and her father. Being there and, and doing that, if I make it very personal, then it, it, it's just such a joy. It's a very committed life um, and it takes a lot of discernment and a lot of prayer. You know, if young people are thinking pursuing religious life, we invite them to come in and live with us, um, or maybe weekends, or for a week, or for how you know long they, they have. So when they come in, they, we're not hiding anything to them. You know, they they what they see is what they get. I had a habit of going into the church when perhaps when things were a bit, or well, just to visit, you know, just say hello. And sometimes if you had a problem, you'd come along and have talked to the Lord about it. And everyone has a calling, but most people, of course, is to married life. I'm the youngest of a big family, so I had married brothers and sisters, and I also had sisters who were already nuns. So I could look at it from both sides, and I, you know, a lot of prayer and thought went into it. But I did have a special rapport right from a young child with elderly, and I was actually helping some two elderly people at home out in the country prior to, like, you know, for many years, you know, just in little ways. But I think it was those little ways that kept growing and kept, you know, so I felt, yeah, this is where I can really be myself. For myself, there was no peace until I actually said yes. And I knew that I just had to go. I had to leave home, leave my family and leave my friends and actually enter. I think advice to young people who are trying to discern is pray about it, give yourself space. I was fortunate to be reared in the country. You need space and you need quiet and time to let the Lord be heard. <laughs> if people feel they're being called to religious life or even to the priesthood, it's very important to actually answer that call. It's uh, sad when you see people later thinking, I should have answered that call and I didn't. People can actually live with this and really get to know if this is what they want to do. And we, again, are very fortunate and privileged too that a lot of these young girls come here and stay with us. And when they come in, we invite them to join in uh, into our prayer life and, um, and all the activities that we do every day. And in that way, it gives them an idea of how the sisters live. We have these girls, two will go home and one will stay. 
You know, some have that vocation, some haven't. We had a, a young adult actually who came in and lived with us um, for a couple of weekends. So, and she joined us in everything that we did. And afterwards, the comment was, you know, I never realised the sisters could have, you know, can have fun. We watch It Takes Two. <laughs> and um, yeah, whatever sport, we're very sporty people as well. People sort of think, oh, religious sisters are very holy and, you know, you come from holy backgrounds. But as I've said before, like, I didn't go to Catholic schools. You know, I wasn't Catholic educated. Um, I didn't even come from a practising Catholic family as such. But, um, you know, it, we just come from normal backgrounds. And we place a lot of emphasis on community life. Um, the support of each other is very important to us. Religious training begins with postulancy, which lasts for one to two years, and it allows the candidate to make a gradual transition from secular to community living. During this time, she is accompanied by a sister assigned to the postulants formation to help her develop an authentic prayer life and continue her individual spiritual growth and vocation discernment. She shares in the lifestyle of the Sisters of Nazareth through community and apostolate. This includes community prayers, recreation, and being involved in the mission of the congregation. Postulancy takes place in a community within the local region. And as the postulant nears the completion of this initial stage, she requests to be received into the congregation to become a novice. On becoming a novice, the sister receives her religious name. The novitiate usually lasts two years and takes place in the congregation's mother house in Hammersmith, London. One of these years, which is known as the canonical year, is a special time of formation. It enables the novice to cultivate a deep personal prayer life and to learn more about the religious life by sharing daily in the congregation's spirituality. The second year of novitiate is designed to allow the novice to expand on what she has learned and spend more time being engaged in the mission of the congregation. In this way, the novice becomes ever more ready to make a total offering of herself to Christ by religious profession. The novice directress accompanies, listens and reflects with the novice during the ongoing discernment of her vocation. On completing her novitiate, the sister makes the vows of chastity, poverty and obedience for one year. After first profession, a sister enters a new relationship with the congregation and assumes the rights and responsibilities of a vowed life. These vows are renewed on a temporary basis for the next five years and can be extended for nine years before final profession. Temporary profession is a period of growth towards perpetual profession, during which time the sister lives in a local community and is involved in the mission of the congregation. After final profession, ongoing formation is made available for all sisters. Through continuing formation, which encompasses her whole life, the sister deepens her consecration to God in all its fullness in keeping with the specific mission, character and charism of the Sisters of Nazareth. And if they find this is not what they're after, they have the freedom to leave. If a person enters, even for a short time, we feel they've gained something, not mm. lost something. Mm. I think if someone has come and they find that it isn't for them, as long as they've given themselves, you know, like every chance to actually see and to learn more, but if they feel that it isn't for them, then, you know, that, that's OK. Just go off and think of something else, do something else, and if those seeds are there, well, they'll never leave you and you'll be drawn and you'll have to go. You just can't resist. Even if they have come, they've tried, and God will actually bless that time and that decision that they've come to say that they've tried. All their natural talents and abilities are taken into consideration and what they feel they could best um, do, because 
we have such a variety of works, um, every talent and every um, gift that naturally people have uh, could be utilised. It's been a time where I've had the privilege of developing my relationship with Christ um, and knowing that whatever I've done through life has been with him. We've done it together and it's been very, very rewarding. When people first found out that I was actually going to become a religious sister, um, you know, some were absolutely horrified and said, you know, you're wasting your life, you know, what are you doing that for? Others were very supportive, even though they couldn't understand, you know, what you're doing and why would you be giving up so much? But when the calling came, it, it was just so strong. You know, initially I tried to just push it down and said, this is not for me, this can't possibly be happening to me. But in the end, I knew that I'd have no peace unless I actually answered that call. And coming away and actually entering religious life, I found that, you know, all of those things were very precious and I look back on my past life with great gratitude, but not with any longing. And I'd like to do it all over again, because I have no regrets. No regrets.